All right, guys, this may be a little review from yesterday. Hopefully, it's all coming out there, but that's all right. When it comes to the Aztecs and their central empire right here, um, their job was to not only um, gain territory in this green area is the main part of their territory, but they had to leave these little pockets of resistance as it was their job to go ahead and conquer people, and not to just conquer the land, but to bring back sacrificial victims. So if they subjugated everybody, there would be no warriors for them to fight. So they had to have a routine where they would attack a village every 10 or 15 years, take all the young boys from, say, 13 to 40, use them as sacrificial victims, and then let the population replenish itself before attacking them again. And they were an extractive empire, forcing the conquered peoples to pay them a vast amount of tribute. And so the Aztecs built this beautiful city here um, with this big giant plaza or square with the Pyramid of the Sun and Pyramid of the Moon. You can see it has the four main causeways sticking way out and the floating bridges in the lake and those aqueducts that brought fresh water constantly to the city, and the chinampas, the floating reed baskets of earth, where it made it easy for them to feed themselves. 60,000 people, Hernando Cortez record, went to the market every single day. He said, man, this is really awesome, so let's go and destroy it. And as the Aztec world was very rigid and militaristic, general, colonel, major, captain, first lieutenant, second lieutenant. There were only two main social classes, very similar to ancient Rome where there was patrician and plebeian. Except in the Aztec world, you could go from being a plebeian, a commoner, to a noble based on your war prowess. And everything in society was stratified and color-coded. The more vibrant and brilliant your outfit, your pinks, your oranges, your fluorescent greens, like back in the 80s, you know, it would, would have been awesome when we loved um, fluorescence. The brighter your color, the higher your social status. And you were forbidden to wear a different color that be live that was different than your social status. So if you were a commoner wearing like a green, a brown, or an off-white, you couldn't wear a purple, or orange, or a um, pink. So um, there are a tiny sliver of artisans and merchants, this um, middle class. And right here we have some paintings. Here is one of the Aztec temples where you were slain in the top where the sun got and the blood would um, drain in. Here is one of the obsidian knives, where as I told you, the Discovery Channel, they went underneath the rib cage and pulled out the heart. And here is a painting or a glyph of when there was a bad famine, um, some type of bad natural disaster. They, were, they sacrificed somewhere between 20 and 30,000 um, people in one day. Uh, the Discovery Channel did a little thing on it a couple years ago called the World of the Aztecs and figured out that they could probably get in 24 hours 24,000 people with their um, technique. Now, while being a noble is always thought of being pretty good, in the Aztec world, nobles were expected to know better. So the standards of behavior for nobles were higher. So punishments for breaking the laws were stricter on the nobles than they were on the commoners, because the nobles were supposed to know better. And everything was divided into cowpulis, right? which are different little neighborhoods. Think of immigration in New York. You have the Irish neighborhood, the Polish neighborhood, and the Jewish neighborhood, and the Italian neighborhood, or your neighborhoods around here, right? We got Larkspur, and we got Parkside, and Homestead Village, and the Highlands, and Camden Place, and Winmore, and Claremont, and Lake Hogan, and Wexford, and Cates Farm, and Fair Oaks, and, and all the way down. Well, each of your neighborhoods, let's say Homestead Village, your home ownership, all right, would be your neighborhood officials. 
And your neighborhood was your world. You went to church there, you went to school there, you grocery shopped there, and you trained for the military there. And each neighborhood was expected to pay taxes and maintain its own cleanliness. And the Aztecs made this competitive, the cleanest neighborhood, the one that paid their taxes the first, got little um, uh, benefits. So your whole life revolved around your cow pulley, which made it easier for the king to govern. And it also was how you went into combat based on your capuli, your neighborhood little um, militia force. In the Aztec society, women had a high um, bit of um, freedom, a lot of prestige and rank in society, um, very high status. Women could speak in court. Aztec women were able to own their own businesses. They were able to become high priestesses, but there was still that glass ceiling. They could be vice president, but not um, president. And women who had many babies were revered as birthing a child, is seen the same as having the rigors of combat. And so the more children you had, the higher and the more wealthy your status was. 1519, the Aztec civilization is going to end when Spanish conquistador Hernando Cortes shows up. And Cortes um, is going to be awestruck by the magnificence and the beauty and the technological sophistication, but his lust for gold and the human sacrifice he cannot deal with. And so the Spanish do a lot of damage to the Aztec world. And while we know a lot about it, it is get governed from the lens of the Spanish conquistadors. We have to view it from their point of view. We don't hear from um, the Aztecs. And that brings us to the great Incan Empire. The um, bedrock foundation running from the Incan Empire from like Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, all the way down to Chile will be the Nazca or the uh, Mojica people. And here you can see some of the glyphs I told you about in class today. Here's the big spider, here's the spider monkey, here's the bird parrot um, looking thing. And the Nazca and the uh, Mojica people are going to be the foundational people like the Olmecs were in Mexico or Ghana was in East Africa. And Near, you know, 1,200, all these small groups are going to come together and form the largest empire in the Mexicos belonging to the great Incan Empire, which runs north and south up the South American coast from Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador. It is a big, big, big empire. And here are the Andes Mountains very sharp and jagged. Think of like shark teeth. And up here you see Lake Titicaca, which you guys asked me about it, I'll tell you what it means. It's very beautiful, but you're high up above the clouds. You're 10,000, 11,000 feet. So the air is very, very um, thin. And you can see the people live in these valleys. So if there is a landslide or a mudslide, they are in a lot of trouble. And this beautiful lake is named Titicaca, which means pouncing leopard. And I'll tell you about that in class um, one day. Well, in the early 1200s, we get this guy, um, you know, uh, who will be the descendant of the early kings who try to begin to consolidate their power. And the early Incas have a small kingdom in the town of Cusco at a north and south and east-west trade routes. And eventually other groups try and come in there and they try and muscle the, the Incas out. And a young 16-year-old guy's dad and old, older brother flee during a war. But little 16-year-old Pachacuti in the 1400s says, Oh no, all right, Pachacuti this, I'm in charge. And standing atop this hilltop through thunder and lightning, he galvanizes his people, and he will lead the great Incan Empire. By the time the Incans are done, their empire will stretch about 2,000 miles long north to south, and nearly 500 to 1,000 miles wide. 
encompassing 16 million linguistically and ethnically diverse peoples. But the Incas were very smart. When they expanded, they didn't go in and use destruction. They would ask you if you wanted to surrender and join their empire, where you get protected by them, you, get, you can trade with them, um, and life is good. You acknowledge them as, as king, you pay taxes and give soldiers. If you didn't do that, they would kind of march their military through to show you how strong they were, and they'd build a big Sam's Club warehouse. And they would allow you to walk through it to see their wealth and splendor. See, wouldn't it make sense to have all of this? If you still said no, then they would come in and um, conquer you. If you surrendered, they would normally allow you to keep your own governmental leadership, your own um, governmental style and your own religion, but you did have to learn to speak Incan. So they just kind of um, absorbed you. Resistance is um, futile. So anyway, um, here uh, is kind of a repeat, but what I wanted to show you are the great Incan roads. I was terrified this guy here was going to fall off. They carved them through mountains or through the jungle with steps, um, they have these roads high on the cliffs, well above the clouds. One of the things the Incas are going to do is build a 14,000 mile road network where they're going to build bridges and roads linking the empire for speed, for communication, and for a military movement. Now, while the empire is widely diverse, it was a strong central monarch, the Sapa Inca was in charge. And one of the things that Incas do is they don't have a currency system, so they come up with this thing known as the Mita system. And the Mita system was a form of labor taxation, where you would pay by volunteering for the military, you know, farmers farmed in the fields, maybe you build a defensive wall or a road, and it required that all able-bodied citizens work a certain number of days per year for the government, usually around 30 to 40 days. And it was scheduled, you know, Max works in um, January, Connor works in February, Sydney works in March, Nia works in April. It's how you do it. And you did governmental public works projects, and that's how you paid your taxes. Kind of makes sense. When your month was up, you went back to your normal job. So here is the road system that I wanted to show you, and a postal system, kind of like a Pony Express. And they built rope suspension bridges, kind of all intertwined um, together. Think of Indiana Jones, or if you guys have ever been up to Grandfather Mountain, anybody's dad ever jump and shake the bridge and people freak out, even though you really um, can't fall? Well, that's what they built to cross gorges or rivers. Um, this road network rivals the um, Romans. Um, and they used special guys known as a chasqui, or a system of runner. They were like cross-country runners who had to run a certain number of miles. And they had special shoes. They had like a little water basket and a lunch basket and this giant conch shell. And they got within range, they'd blow up. And the other Chonsky would start limbering up and getting running. You would take the basket and the letter and you would hand it off. And this guy ran the next five to six miles. So they had relay stations throughout the entire road network to speed communications, and they could go end to end in five days. Guys, moving and running 24 hours a day. Like the Mayas in Mexico, they were masters at terraced farming. You can see the little village right down in here, and they had these thin fields carved all the way into the mountain. In the modern day, they kind of have this big sink drain or toilet bowl, so if the rainwater does wash away the soil and the crops, it will all collect down here, or at, at the bottom. So to maximize their agricultural space in the steep, sheer mountains, they developed the terrace um, agricultures growing their lush crops. Again, all this was done by pure human labor. They didn't have access to the wheel or beasts of burden other than llamas and alpacas, and they're really not good for carrying heavy loads. One of the things the Incas 
do or don't do is they never develop a writing system. Instead, they develop this kipu, which was a series of knots or colored beads on a strand of like copper or gold wire. It's almost like an old um, abacus. And the Inca were able to make records based on the knot or the knot length or the um, colored bead. So, for example, there is a yellow bead, then there is a green bead, then a blue and a yellow, another blue, another yellow, a blue, and then another yellow, then another green. Well, the yellow stands for the sun, green is the earth, and the blue is water. So if we go one green and then three blues and three yellows, it meant a distance of traveling three days over water till you had land again. Now that's a simplistic explanation, but that's basically what the kipu is. Unfortunately, and raised by the Spanish or the English, you know, Sir Francis Drake attacking Spanish ships, there was the master or the Rosetta Stone kipu that Sir Francis Drake was sending back to the queen that is lost somewhere in the jungles or out at sea. And our idea of the kipu is just um, guesswork. The Incas, like everybody else, were um, polytheistic, where Entai, the sun god, was the most important. And the Incas believed that their king, the Sapa Inca, was a direct descendant of Entai. So the Incas practiced sacrifice. Sometimes it was food. Most of the time it was animals. And very rare occasions, a human would be sacrificed to please um, the, the gods. Um, however, they do have an odd thing where it con concerns their mummies. Incan mummies date... Um, as old or even older in some cases than Egyptian mummies. And they're among the holiest objects. They are preserved and they sit. And oftentimes um, they're brought food and water every day. Servants take care of them. Sometimes they're picked up and they're set beside each other so the ancient rulers can talk. And they were carried in religious um, processions as if they were still alive. Kind of strange but it was the um, Incan thing. If you go um, to Cusco today, you can still see a little bit here of the ancient Pyramid of the Sun, which was totally destroyed um, by the Spanish, and then the Pyramid of the Sun and the Moon as always were covered in gold and silver. A um, little over 100 years ago, 107 years ago, the big city of Machu Picchu was founded, and it's high up in the Andes Mountains, an amazing work of architecture. But we don't know if it was a re retreat for the nobles, whether it was a Pachacuti estate, whether it was for religious ceremonies. We don't know, but here it is. You can see some of the terraces on the side, the stone walls leading to the city on these sheer cliffs where it would be very difficult to attack and the homes and the apartments in the streets um, built in there. Again, it's well worth it if you ever chance to go and visit it. The Incas will reach the height of their power in the 1500s. And at that time, there was a power struggle between the king, Athlupa, and his brother, Huskar. And they were fighting over who was going to be the king. And Athlupa wins the civil war as the empire is torn apart and Huskar supposedly makes off with his giant golden chain and Athlupa emerges victorious. And then all of a sudden, Francisco Pizarro shows up. So right at the height, the zenith of their empire, exactly like the Aztecs, when the Incas reach the height of their empire, in comes the um, Spanish. And Francisco Pizarro rolls in and he sees that there's not a whole lot of gold, but there's a bunch of silver, and he kind of befriends a flupa, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're hanging out, and then all of a sudden, Pizarro's men grab that flupa, and they throw him in like, you know, a barn, and they hold him there for three days, and all of a sudden, the ink and drum, bum, 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 start beating, and Pizarro talks that every day, warriors from all over the empire started gathering on this mountainside, across. 
And every day the fires got bigger and big, bigger and bigger. And they're like, oh man, what have we done here? This ain't good. We can't defeat these guys. And they are about to let a Thlupa go. And he's like, hey, if you let me go, not knowing that they were about to, I'll fill this room, you know, um, you know, um, with gold and twice over with silver. And Pizarro's like, yeah, can you come here and give like the parade wave to the people? The warriors see their king. They think everything's okay. And a Lupa fills the room with gold and silver. And then Pizarro kills him um, anyway. And so that will signal the defeat of the great um, Incan Empire. The Spanish capture Cusco without firing um, a shot with very little struggle, and from that point on, the wealth of Mexico and Peru will fuel the Spanish Habsburg Empire back home in Spain. So um, anyway, a couple other little things um, to talk about um, is the Macona or the Mamaconas, the women who made the clothes and brewed the special beer chicha for the Sapa Inca, and as a quick review, the oldest civilization in the Americas are the Olmecs from Old Mexico, coming to power 1500 to 400 BC from the time of the Trojan War to um, the Persian Wars with ancient Greece. And after them are the two twin cities of Sao Lorenzo and La Venta, kind of the Harappa and Mohenjo Daro of Mesoamerica as San Lorenzo declines in power, La Venta rises. But they have the 110 foot tall pyramid of the sun, one of the last few remaining structures. That's it, guys, for Mesoamerica part two. Make sure you watch part one, and I'll see you guys soon. Have a good day.